Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Bakari. Today I am joined by Michael Neary, who is one of several Democrats running for Rhode Island's 2nd Congressional District following uh, Congressman Jim Langevin's retirement announcement. He's a former national political strategist and recently worked for Ohio Governor John Kasich's 2016 presidential campaign. Michael, how are you today? Doing great, uh, Ray. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. And it's good to have you on. My first question here, you're one of several Democrats running for the now open congressional seat. Can you explain for those watching a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Congress? Yeah, definitely. And it's a growing field, uh, even as we speak today. Uh, like you said, my name is Michael Neary. Uh, I'm from uh, the Coventry West Warwick communities. Uh, I grew up in both towns uh, throughout different periods of my life. And uh, I'm running for Congress uh, because, you know, i we believe that the second district needs a uh, representative who's going to uh, stick up for equality, uh, you know, justice in our democracy on really for everybody here in the second district. When running for Congress, it's more of a nationalized race. So issues are going to vary from candidate to candidate. For example, Congressman Langevin, he focused on cybersecurity as one of his main issues. Mm -hmm. Looking at some of your key policy proposals, one of them is uh, to provide stability to all who need it. Uh, starting off with a, an emergency one-year rescue plan for those making under $100,000 a year. Uh, what would this emergency one-year rescue plan mean for residents in the district? Yes, yeah, so I call it my uh, PPP 2.0 plan. Uh, you know, there's kind of three uh, core pillars to it. You, you know, each P gets, a, uh, gets its own point. Uh, so that first one is, uh, like you said, providing that emergency relief. So uh, for anyone who's making under $100,000, I think, you know, if we truly want to move on from the pandemic and all of the things that, uh, you know, we've had to deal with here over the last couple of years, uh, you know, a lot of families are really, you know, still hurting from that. And uh, so that means, you know, one year of guaranteed, you know, housing, uh, food, medicine, uh, childcare, you know, that continued debt relief, uh, you know, one year extension of that, uh, you know, that's just to, you know, give people that, you know, little bit of breathing space uh, to get back on their feet. Uh, and then from there, so, you know, move straight into that second P, and that is uh, public options uh, in uh, healthcare, uh, higher education, and then, uh, you know, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, you know, those, those federal uh, dollars coming into, you know, all of our states uh, is a public option in uh, jobs, essentially, too. You know, uh, there's going to be, you know, these green energy climate action projects, uh, you know, things like you know, more things like the Block Island wind farm uh, that, you know, we're going to need people for. Uh, and then, you know, things like the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Pell Grant program, you know, named, of course, after, you know, Rhode Island's own uh, Senator Pell. Uh, you know, we can build on those programs to, you know, provide those, finally provide those public options in healthcare and then a tuition free pathway uh, to any student uh, who wants to pursue that college pathway. And then that third P is, uh, you know, to pay people a living wage. Finally, you know, the federal minimum wage is still seven twenty-five an hour. Uh, you know, and that, you know, that hasn't moved in, you know, just years and years and years now. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, one, some of the easiest ways to offset, you know, the inflation uh, and uh, some of these other issues, you know, you know, getting more you know money in the hands of people who really need it uh you know we raise the minimum wage to uh, 20 dollars an hour at least you know as a starting point uh i believe so uh those are those are the kind of the three uh core uh parts of the uh, of my plan uh i've talked a lot about uh, uh, different things over the last few weeks but those are the, kind of my three priorities right off the bat just to get uh the, the assistance that people need one of those priorities you had mentioned in your answer actually plays into the next topic I wanted to talk about, which is uh, the passing the $20 an hour federal minimum wage. It's uh, The minimum wage is one of uh, many polarizing topics in American politics at the moment. It is at a point of discussion. Uh, it is a point of discussion, I'd say, I should add, that the House is probably going to flip red depending on uh, how things go in the midterms and based on a uh, historical precedent. And uh, the yeah, Senate. Not a done deal, but yeah, I, I hear yeah. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Senate is uh, anybody's game at this point. It's kind of like sure. a toss up. So <laughs> Congress, the control of Congress is up in the air. So, in that scenario where the House flips, uh, do you see the $20 minimum wage being uh, uh, possible to pass? I mean, uh, it, it is going to come down to whether or not Democrats are going to be able to keep the majority or not, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, there are certainly Republicans who are willing to, you know, work across the aisle, you know, pass things like that bipartisan infrastructure bill. But by and large, unfortunately, you know, it, 
you know, after January 6th, you still had, you know, over, you know, almost 150 members, you know, Republican members reject the election still. I mean, there's just that group who will not lift a finger to help people. And that's, you know, and that's unfortunate, uh, you know, and so, you know, we need to keep the majority uh, for, you know, not just Rhode Island, but for all of our, you know, fellow Americans. I mean, you know, the that Build Back Better plan, I mean, that's being stalled out because, you know, there just aren't quite those extra votes to get through the Republican plus, you know, some of that smaller Democratic opposition in the Senate, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, the House is still only, you know, that five vote margin or so. So, I mean, it is going to take, you know, that expanded effort to, to, to win a majority here. And I think that starts by, you know, running on a platform of, uh, you know, really articulating uh, what we're going to do to, to help the American people and our fellow Rhode Islanders. Continuing on uh, your platform, you're also in favor of canceling student loan debt up to $50,000, which would apply to tens of millions of Americans. And uh, what ways do you see that helping Americans? Well, it's going to help millions of people. I mean, you know, the the cycle of debt that this this amount of uh, debt creates is uh, really vicious for just so many uh, borrowers who, you know, make these decisions, you know, at a very young age. And, you know, for a lot um, for a lot of them as well, uh, you know, as we've seen in, you know, in the for-profit side of things, it's really deceptive outright practices that go on. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a very controversial thing when you have people like, you know, Senator Schumer, you know, the majority leader uh, saying things like, you know, President Biden could, you know, do this with the stroke of a pen. Uh, I, so I think there's clearly, uh, the, you know, that shows clearly that there's that recognition that, you know, this is an urgent issue uh, that, again, can provide that kind of direct immediate impact on just so many people. You know, if people, you know, it's not about, you know, giving people that money directly, but if they don't have to make that $300, $400, $500 payment every month, uh, you know, that's a game changer for just millions of people right there. So that's what it's all about. A lot of the and policies- I'm Sorry, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I would no just worries. say, on, you know, it, it, then, you know, on the other side of that coin, though, is to, you know, reform that system going forward so that future borrowers are not trapped in this, you know, and that goes back to that tuition free pathway and, uh, and, and whatnot. So uh, it is all tied together, for sure. Yeah, student loans are very tricky with the interest rates. And it, oh, yeah. it's, it's just confusing, especially all, if all, someone... all of these issues, all of these issues are, you know, are just not things that we can discuss over, you know, 30 second little, you know, back and forth, you know, they, they are, they do require the time to, you know, bring everyone together and talk about and, and build a coalition really of, uh, you know, of what can be done here. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. No worries. Continue. Exactly. Yeah. I just want to clarify because a lot of these policies, it sounds like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it like going based on the idea of a, a trickle up economy, something that like Andrew Yang was going based on when he was proposing ideas like UBI when he ran for president? I think that's, that's a good way of uh, looking at it, essentially. I mean, you look at what, you know, the, the right, you know, put out there about trickle down and, you know, just, you know, the scam that basically was on people, uh, you know, when we talk, you know, even when we talk about things like raising the minimum wage, you hear like, oh, we can't do that. Really, like, you know, CEO salaries go up, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred to, you know, two thousand percent. And, you know, the sky doesn't fall down. But when you, and, and, you know, we move, you know, we move mountains to make sure that, you know, the banks and, you know, other large, large corporations are taken care of during, you know, times of great crisis. But, uh, you know, and then you see the flashes of it, you know, like stimulus checks, uh, you know, things like that, you know, the, these things are possible. It's just a matter of prioritizing them. I think more than anything else. And, and I think trickle up is, is that sort of philosophy that we need to be following here to really help people. While we're still on the topic of talking about debt, speaking of the debt, a big national issue that goes under the radar almost all the time, which is interesting because uh, the national debt is at $30 trillion. Politics aside, very concerning. There are plans uh, like Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky's uh, penny plan. He now calls it the three penny plan where you would take a, a penny from every federal dollar spent put it in a separate account. And then in five years, about the budget's balance, 10 years, you have a trillion dollar surplus. It's three pennies now after all the COVID relief bills that were passed. Uh, whether it's something like that, how would you try to, to address the issue of the national debt if elected? So, yeah, I mean, no doubt, you know, the national debt is, you know, a serious issue, but, you know, I think it gets politicized to a point, you know, where it, it makes people believe that we are, you know, going to go broke if we spend any more money. And the reality of this situation is, you know, 
the United States, you know, uh, with the dollar sets, you know, has set the tone for the global economy for, you know, quite some time now. I mean, it's really, you know, it's been the consensus, so, you know, and obviously, you know, things are happening around the world quite a bit over the last few weeks, but, you know, the dollar is still that, you know, baseline for the entirety of the global economy. So, uh, yes, the national debt is, is a serious issue and we need to make sure that we're not overdoing it and that, you know, these, you know, these proposals, these investments in people that, you know, I, that we're talking about here that, uh, you know, are these once in a generation kind of things that, I, you know, I, we believe will really help people, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things is of more value and will pay, you know, pay for itself in just, you know, an infinite number of ways, you know, for instance, you know, who knows what'll happen when we unlock higher education for you know the millions of you know future uh, gen children and future generations. So um, you know we we do need to make sure you know these investments are you know paid for or you know at least we can weigh them against you know that uh, overall kind of long term good. You know it's almost that same kind of principle. Of this you know what I think what you mentioned there about that you know penny savings or you know that's it sounds like a nice little gimmick but you know we could help people now and then make you know lift everybody up now and you know and the economy will grow at a I mean, it's already grown at that 7% rate, you know, over the last, uh, you know, quarter or so, you know, we just need to keep, you know, that kind of pedal to the metal, you know, and make sure that it's still growing at, you know, that kind of, uh, so we can get back up to that pre COVID level of, uh, you know, where our economy was at, and then, and then just build so much more on top of that to get to give people that chance to get back, uh, and uh, really an opportunity to really grow. Just to clarify, because the national debt is a very complicated sure. issue, uh, yeah. the investments like with those policy proposals yeah. we've been talking about earlier, yep. your uh, your plan would be that that would increase the economy, which would then help pay oh, down the debt. Well, there's that. I mean, you also need to look at. I mean, you know, the Trump tax cuts. You know, really slash. You know, corporate tax rates and 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 you know those personal uh, tax rates down quite a bit. I mean, I look at that corporate rate, especially. You know, it has. You know, it's been historically. At, you know somewhere between 35 40% for a very long time, you know, the Trump tax cuts brought it down to almost 20%. And I think President Biden wants to raise it to just below 30. So I mean, it's things like that, that, you know, Republicans say, Oh, you're gonna raise taxes. Well, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, some modest uh, rollbacks of, you know, a tax cut that was enacted, uh, like in the year immediately prior to a global uh, pandemic. And now, you know, of course, today with, you know, uh, war breaking out uh, in uh, Ukraine and uh, with Russia, uh, you know, we're going to need, you know, just the resources to deal with, uh, you know, some of these uh, historical challenges that are still evolving, you know, again, at, you know, in the seconds here that we're speaking now, uh, you know, the, the president just finished his, his remarks on on, uh, on what's going on, the situation on the ground in, in Ukraine there, which is really just, you know, just a horrifying situation. And uh, it really is, uh, again, it's it's so much more than that. It's that fight against, uh, you know, dem it's a, for democracy against these, these tyrants, uh, you know, coming head to head here. Kind of circling it back to the beginning of the the topic for the national yeah, debt, would yeah. you support a, a measure like the penny plan? Because it sounds like uh, it, you're not. It, it sounds like a gimmick to me. I mean, you know, because <laughs> that's what, you know, people like Senator Paul, you know, kind of, you know, play on, uh, you know, they, they, you know, they say they're interested in doing all of these things, you know, to, you know, because we, you know, the, the be all end all is the national debt to some of these people, which again, I think is just kind of misguided. Uh, so again, I would rather see that, you know, that kind of money go more towards those kind of direct investments to, to help people, which I think, again, is the more, you know, long term solution to, to, uh, you know, continuing to grow our economy to manage the national debt in a way that it doesn't become, uh, you know, it's almost like, you know, when you think about your own kind of, you know, income to debt ratio, I guess, <laughs> more or less, you know, there, you know, there's a tolerance level that, you know, the country as that global financial leader can tolerate. So I think as long as we're not overdoing it and coming up with a ways to, you know, fund these plans, uh, you know, through some of those, you know, mod, you know, modest tax increases on, you know, the wealthier, um, you know, part, you know, segments of the you know population and then, you know, the corporate tax rates and whatnot. Uh, you know, I think, I think we can, uh, you know, really, uh, 
do a much better job than, you know, some kind of, you know, penny saver <laughs> gimmick like that. Speaking of another under under the radar issue, uh, term limits mm-hmm. for members of Congress, sure. uh, the current incumbent, he got elected in 2000, uh-huh. served uh, 11 terms, 20 years. I wasn't thought of yet. You were eight years old. It's a it's an issue that has bipartisan support. Mm-hmm. Where do you stand on term limits for members of Congress? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I. I, I think I'm, I'm generally pretty comfortable with them. I mean, going into this, I don't, you know, see myself doing it for, you know, uh, you know, uh, for, for life or anything like that or anything close to that. Uh, you know, I, uh, my fiance and I, we haven't started our, you know, our own family yet. You know, we, we aren't, you know, she's my fiance. We're not, you know, even married yet. So, uh, you know, there are just a lot of things that, you know, I'm going still going to want to do in my life that I just see, you know, again like when it comes to things like raising a family like how does that really uh, work by you know committing to fully serving as a member of congress you know but that's obviously down the line a little bit here you know of course but uh you know it definitely you know in the conversations that we had as a family you know it certainly came up and you know those are you know our kind of private conversations so uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that but i will say i'm just i'm comfortable with the idea of term limits uh and i think there's kind of just kind of be some self-imposed ones uh here for, for me at least personally there 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 are politicians who do self-imposed term limits yeah. like former rhode islander pat toomey actually he's famously done it he's a senator of pennsylvania right now he mm-hmm. pledged to do three terms in the house did the three terms ran for the Senate pledged to only do two. He's now Talked retiring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he's now retiring. So that seat's open. Uh, do you, I, I don't want to like press too much into it, but if you're, if you're comfortable with saying it, do you have an, a number of years or set uh, terms? Yeah. So, you know, we just had our, you know, kickoff event on, on Saturday, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, our campaign, you know, our campaign, our movement that we're trying to build here is just getting off of the ground. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm just not ready to kind of commit to something like that, but I, I do, you know, I'm very comfortable in saying that, yes, there is, there is, uh, you know, going to be a time, you know, that's not 20 years from now uh, where I'm going to say that it's, you know, that it, the, the time has, you know, come to, to pass the torch. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it, it'll probably be more like 10 than, let's just say it'll be more like 10 than 20, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, I would, I would say I'd be comfortable with saying for now. You had, uh, looking more at your uh, background uh, before uh, running for this election, you had worked for a uh, former Ohio governor, John Kasich's uh, yeah. campaign for president in 2016. You're uh, running in a democratic primary. And although Kasich is a more moderate Republican and nowadays uh, looking at that, the, the, the party, uh, <laughs> exactly. He yeah. spoke. He spoke at the DNC. It, it may con- it may concern some Democratic voters. Is this something mm-hmm. that District Two Democratic voters should be worried about? That you worked for a Republican? Well, I think I'm speaking to all Rhode Island uh, voters in the second district in this primary here. Really, I mean, Rhode Island ha- does have this open primary uh, where you know unaffiliated voters who you know make up you know the almost uh, a full majority of the district, uh, pretty close to it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, have the opportunity to vote in either primary. So, uh, you know, but I am talking to, you know, Democratic uh, Republicans who, you know, who are, who want a better way forward, uh, you know, who don't see, you know, their own path in the Republican Party anymore. Um, you know, I would just say, you know, I, I moved up to New Hampshire to work, uh, you know, on governor, on behalf of Governor Kasich's campaign, because I believe that he represented you know, the best way forward for the Republican Party to avoid what what's happened over the last few years. You know, I, I describe it as almost like trying to like pull the car off of the cliff as the driver is, you know, pushing on the, the pedal to still, you know, go off of it. And, uh, you know, Rhode Island just has this, you know, history of, you know, independent thinking and electing, you know, kind of different, uh, you know, kind of uh, leaders who, you know, don't fit that particular mold of what, you know, maybe the media narrative or, uh, you know, what, what people's just general perception of a politician is. I mean, it really is just a unique place kind of across the board, uh, you know, and that is, you know, it includes our elected officials of, of, of years past. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna just check a box for, you know, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, I am going to, you know, be on my own two feet, you know, with my own ideas uh, and uh, presenting them to all of Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, if if you see and hear what and believe in what our movement is trying to accomplish, then, uh, you know, I hope you'll 
you know, join in voting in the Democratic primary when when the time comes and uh, to cast your ballot for, for for what we're trying to do here. Are you for or against statehood for uh, Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico? Uh, yes, for both. Uh, that's an easy one. You know, some of these some of these issues are, are easy <laughs> kind of yes. And I mean, you know, uh, making them happen is obviously, you know, very different. But, you know, in terms of like, yes or no. Yes, uh, for sure. No doubt. I mean, we, we, we can't let people be in that kind of limbo of, oh, you can vote for president, but you don't get a senator. Like, <laughs> it's it's kind of really silly when you think about it that way. Like, it's just, why are we doing it? Why are we doing this to people? There are some times in politics where a compromise may have to happen. And I often uh, haven't asked about this compromise whenever I interview and uh, ask about this topic, but I'm going to start doing it now with this topic since I've asked it a lot of times. I don't want to sound like a broken record. Uh, there's a compromise where, speaking of the representation, because that is the biggest concern for the pro DC statehood group that they don't have representation in Congress. Well, so it's right in Maryland, the, the DNV area. It's right in Maryland. Uh, would you, if, why why not just have it go part of maryland they'll get congressional and senatorial representation i guess you i mean it, it, that could potentially be i uh you know a, a something that i could see myself supporting if it was in the legitimate best interests of washington dc uh you know it is kind of its own unique place as you know the you know, it's almost like a city state uh, a little bit uh, uh, where it's, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the seat of government, but, you know, you do have the uh, the day to day functions of, you know, the, the city around it. So uh, uh, to put it under another state might might not be the best way. But, you know, if, you know, if the, the panel that, you know, determines uh, that 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 is, you know, I, you know, when it is, you know, further studied, then uh, you know, it's just going to be what's what is the best best path forward for the citizens of Washington. Another uh, another topic that's going for further study, like you had mentioned, is uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, mm -hmm. At the beginning of the congressional session, there was a, a heavy push to add more Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. This is out of reaction because the last three were appointed by uh, President Trump. Would you mm -hmm. vote? Uh, and to my understanding, it's just passing a simple bill because there's no like set number. We're just going mm -hmm. off of a precedent. Would you vote in favor of or against legislation to pack the Supreme Court? Well, so I'll say a few things about this. So I'll start with what you just said about like that it would just be a matter of a yes or no bill. And when you and like that may be true, but when you think about what like you know has happened in the past, like even FDR tried this uh, you know a long time ago, and it and it did not you know he passed an ambitious agenda, but that was not something that like moved very well at all. So uh, you know I I think. You know, it is a much larger lift, you know, maybe, you know, there aren't those like constitutional hurdles, but uh, I think it is a kind of a much larger deal than that. Uh, I, I think I'm open to it. Uh, but what I'm more interested in in the short term is kind of a more focused approach to uh, overall kind of judicial reform. Uh, I think, you know, especially uh, in terms of the Supreme Court with uh, Justice, you know, Clarence Thomas uh, and the, the kind of misconduct that's come out uh, related to his wife uh, in the New York Times and other reporting over the last couple of days of alone, alone have revealed her kind of greater role in January 6th, which I'm not, uh, I, I've tried to keep up on the story as much as possible because again, the, the House of Representatives initiates impeachments against all, all officers of the United States, which includes judges, of course. So um, I think there needs to be a very serious discussion about looking into possibly impeaching uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, and then right behind him, I think you also need to look at uh, Justice Kavanaugh as well. I believe it's Senator Whitehouse who has um, requested more information from the FBI and the Justice Department uh, surrounding some of the issues uh, in his confirmation, separate from some of the more public things that went on. Uh, what Senator Whitehouse, I believe, is focusing on is uh, essentially the FBI set up a tip line uh, for people to call into about, uh, you know, the investigation that they were conducting. They received thousands of tips, and then not a single thing about that was ever talked about ever again after, like, he was, you know, that confirmation got, <laughs> you know, just pushed through over there. And so, um, you know, if there are things that you know, are worth looking into that were covered up a couple of years ago, then, uh, you know, I think uh, it's definitely worth uh, re-exploring as well. But I think at the very least, I mean, just based on the new information that's come out about, uh, you know, 
Justice Thomas and his really, you know, and it's not just what his wife is, is been doing. It's about his own personal connections to what, you know, I think he himself has been more involved uh, behind the scenes as well in some of these things. And then, you know, these groups have issues directly before the court and for to spend decades of not disclosing what, what uh, you and your uh, family are doing, I think is, I mean, you're, you're a justice of the Supreme Court. I mean, people have been, you know, removed from much, you know, lower benches, you know, at the county level uh, for, for less misconduct than that. So, uh, you know, let's, let's see where the, where the trail leads us here on, I think on both, on both justices. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. I, uh, there is a little bit to unpack with that. So going back yeah, to the- no, I, so, I, I, so I put a lot out there, yeah. There, there, yeah, there is a little bit to unpack on that. Sure. The, so just saying January, 2023 comes, yep. sworn into Congress, the bill comes to the floor, yeah. add more Supreme Court justices. How are you going to vote on it? Because uh, uh, you, you would, be, you would yeah, probably I mean, be a at, crucial vote. Yeah, I mean, at, at, fir at first, you know, my gut says, like, yes, it is probably something that is, like, necessary to, you know, uh, I think the first bill needs to be explore the issue, you know, really, like, let, like, let see what an overall kind of, reform of the judiciary system as a whole maybe looks and then what you know what because you have the supreme court you have the federal courts i mean you have the appeals courts uh, you know there's there's all kinds of different things that uh you know that i mean to be to be perfectly frank you know that republicans have done to stack all of these courts uh in you know in different ways with some you know just blatantly unqualified nominees as well, uh, you know, really more partisan actors. I mean, you, you know, the an organization that people should be more familiar with is the Federalist Society. Uh, you know, they're the ones that, uh, you know, Trump literally took his marching orders from uh, to appoint to people to the Supreme Court too. So uh, the work they have done behind the scenes, and again, Shel uh, Senator Whitehouse has touched on this quite a bit as well, the connection between dark money and, the, and what's happened in our courts are intertwined a hundred percent you know it's it's a roadmap from you know a to b to c of what's happened between you know campaign finance dark money the courts all of it is uh you know really intertwined here so it again it's just not one of those things that's that yes no kind of you know statehood yes but you know when it comes to the courts there's about like you know there's 20 different things that are just going on with it still evolving today that we need to kind of fully unpack before we do anything there. Going back to the impeaching the Supreme Court justices, that's um, an interesting proposal because I, I haven't heard that before. And I, I'm pretty sure that the process is still the same as impeaching a president. I yeah. remember we had uh, learned that in law day one time. Federal in judges have been yeah. impeached within the last uh, decade or so as well. So it, do it does happen. So when, when it comes to impeaching a Supreme Court justice, because we're, we're, the, the dialogue when President Trump was impeached a second mm -hmm. time from the right, I should say, I, I want to add preface it with that. The right was saying that the, the left is going to pay for this. And it, it could be a possibility that if the House GOP ends up getting a majority, that they might try to do an impeachment on Biden just to put a black mark on his presidency. Oh, because, I mean, they made that clear, out of, yep. Out of reaction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. would, would that, is there, are there any concerns that that would backfire if you impeach two Supreme Court justices that were selected <laughs> I mean, by a president fairly? So sure. I mean, if, if you have, you know, solid evidence that, you know, uh, you know, one of the other justices on the court, you know, uh, Justice Kagan or uh, Sotomayor, you know, if you have evidence that they are involved in this, you know, kind of nefarious activities that, you know, I'm, you know, saying that the evidence is pretty clear about, uh, you know, at least Justice Thomas, I think, uh, just based on some of this initial reporting uh, the, of a need of an investigation, then, uh, you know, I think, I mean, it's about holding people accountable regardless of party. You know, it doesn't matter that they are, you know, affiliated with conservatives and Republicans. I, if you're acting a certain way, it it's not right for you to continue to serve in the office that, again, it, especially with the Supreme Court, the federal courts, these are lifetime appointments. So like, you, you don't get to just act with impunity just because you have a lifetime appointment. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because that's the first time I'd ever heard the a yeah no I mean it, it, which it's is not something that probably a lot of people but it's you know Congress has a lot of power that it doesn't that it sits on that it doesn't really full you know that it has ceded to you know the executive branch or uh, you know just doesn't really you know act on very much and uh, 
you know, but Congress and, you know, is the people's house. It's where everything is supposed to start. And, uh, you know, that, you know, it's start, you know, revenue bills, you know, tax bills, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, things like impeachments, all of that, you know, they originate in the house, not the Senate, you know, not through the executive, it's, it's in the people's house where some of these things have to happen first, right in the beginning here. So going off of the, the people's house, uh, it is a, a controversial topic. This next one, members of Congress trading stocks, that's controversial. There's members of Congress. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be public service. Yeah. They're becoming yeah. millionaires off of it. Senator John Ossoff is introducing a bill banning this, and it would apply to judges and Supreme Court justices and no loopholes where the, the spouse or like a, yeah. a, a close household, relative. Yeah. Yeah. So if it, so it it's if you do get elected and say this bill hasn't passed yet, can you assure Rhode Islanders that you will not partake in any stock trading or use any loopholes? I, I, I don't trade stocks now, and I think it would look mighty suspicious if I uh, started uh, <laughs> as a congressman. So yeah, that has my vote. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm, you said you said they're becoming millionaires off of it. What it really is is they're already millionaires, and then they're making more million millions out of off of it. So, uh, you know, it it's just one of those things that again, when it's you know, some of these are going to be easy easier yeses <laughs> to just say kind of right off the bat, and uh, yeah, that's one of them. So no, you're you're. If, if you know you have to do these financial disclosures and stuff even as candidates uh you know you have to submit certain things and the only thing that's going to be newsworthy is that you know i'm going to be probably you know out of 435 i'll be in the probably that bottom at least the bottom 10 i think probably more like the bottom five uh if not maybe even <laughs> three of people who just aren't you know wealthy in congress uh compared to the rest of them there so yeah going to my uh non-political topics i like to do for the end uh do you have any hobbies uh, yeah, uh, so my fiance and I, uh, we, you know, we have our two cats, uh, and, uh, you know, we just like to do all kinds of, you know, just different things around town. Uh, and then, uh, I'm a, I'm a big reader, uh, it just, you know, really anything, you know, the news books, uh, I'm just always kind of just consuming information in, in some way. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, politics is really in public service has just always been a passion of mine. I really am always kind of just, you know, on, on Twitter, or, uh, <laughs> you know, just reading an article or something like that. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just your, you know, movies, TV shows, things like that, especially over the last couple of years where that was sort of a <laughs> kind of became the main hobby a little bit there for a little while. Uh, you know, so yeah, that's, that's, uh just kind of what I like to do. My final question is one that I ask everyone on the show to keep tradition. And that is, in your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? Oh, I mean, it's, it's the food. It's gotta be the food. I, I'm, I, the thing that, it, it, you know, I've lived, you know, out of state, you know, here and there, different parts of my life. And, uh, you know, but when you, when you grow up in Rhode Island and it's like all, you know, for half of your life, uh, when you leave and then you can't just like, go to Dell's or, you know, get a, you know, a slice of strip pizza or, you know, any kind of number of these, these things, you know, the seafood, you know, uh, it, you can't just go get a, you know, a, a cup of good chowder and, uh, you know, nobody knows what a clam cake is. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that is, I mean, that's just gotta be it for me. I have to give the Rhode Island litmus test since you mentioned it uh, for Dell's, uh, how do you drink it? Ooh, so I, I think cherry is probably my favorite. And then, I mean, of course, never with a straw. So, <laughs> okay. I just had, I had a test. I had to give the litmus test whenever it's yeah. mentioned. No, I had I to check that. It, you'll, you'll, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, I've lived out of state the last couple of years, you know, as part of, you know, what I've been doing, uh, you know, out, out, you know, starting with working for, you know, Governor Kasich, but, you know, I've always been a Rhode Islander at heart. You know, my parents, you know, live in the same, you know, condo community that uh, we grew up in. They, you know, that's just where they've found themselves the last couple of years now. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've just, you know, I, I have, have always just been a Rhode Islander and yeah, the, the Dells thing though, I mean, if <laughs> you, you'd be able to see right through right away. If, uh... <laughs> to, if Andrew Yang, he, he got made fun of on Twitter for having it with the straw and he went to Brown university. So that mm -hmm. ever since then I was like, 
litmus test for all of our politics, all you know, of our Rhode politicals. Things, you know, I guess if, if you do need a spoon, I think that is, that is fine. It does get a little messy. You know, if it's a you hot You got to fight the cup. You got to fight the cup. Yeah. yeah you, I mean, you, you know, but not everybody wants to, <laughs> wants to do it like that. So I, you know, but, but if you're starting to mix in straws, hmm, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm not, you just, uh, you just drinking it with a straw, but it's looking at you like, <laughs> well uh yeah, i think yeah. i think that's a good good spot to end it there michael right, i want to yeah. thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show you. it's been a pleasure of mine to have you on and thank it's great to speak with you today likewise uh, and uh thank you for uh, watching this episode of reality tv if you want to see future episodes as soon as, as soon as they're posted on this channel please click the subscribe button and the post notification bell icon down below i'm raymond bakari and i'll see you on the next episode